In those days, Japanese naval aviation was characterized by elitism. There is nothing wrong with elitism, but the point was that they seemed to have forgotten that the essence of air power lies in mass deployment. In this respect, I valued Commander Ozawa very highly. Although he was an amateur in the field of aviation, he quickly saw that the key point of aviation is collective deployment. Consequently, I wanted to be under his command for the following year, fully involved in mass assault practice drills by carrier based air power. Unfortunately, there were not enough opportunities to practice. The first aviation squadron consisted solely of the Akagi, and only saw you remained in the second aviation squadron this year because of Hiryu's absence due to remodeling. Besides, in practice drill or training, Akagi and Soryu often assumed enemy positions against each other. Still, Ozawa was very enthusiastic about mass assault, taking every opportunity to negotiate with various air branches to establish coordination with land-based medium bombers or even with seaplanes of the homeland battle squadrons. As the group commander of the Akagi Air Squadron, I always took unified command of the combined group, but what gave me a headache each and every time was the problem of group assembly. If assembly is not done perfectly, the intended mass assault is sporadic, failing to exert its concentrated power. However, with the planes of several air squadrons coming from diverse locations, it was not an easy job to assemble at a predetermined point above the ocean at a fixed time. I got fed up, as we had not succeeded even once in getting together at the assembly point at exactly the fixed time, always being obliged to wait. In view of the situation, I came up with an idea. The idea was that the problem of assembly over the ocean occurs because of the independent deployment of individual carriers. However, this can be solved by group deployment. Such a simple matter was out of consideration in those days. The conventional wisdom that prevailed was independent deployment, the objective being to make the carrier less visible and to reduce the risk of enemy attack in light of the carrier's vulnerability. However, even for this problem, group deployment of carriers can provide a bigger number of anti-air escort planes to protect the entire carrier group more effectively and with greater protection. I recommended this idea to Ozawa commander. If Akagi and Kaga of the 1st Air Squadron and Soryu and Hiryu of the 2nd Air Squadron are organized as a single aviation fleet, we can carry out our practice drills for massive assault as a carrier air force. Based on a concentrated deployment of the four carriers, everybody in the Navy will realize that carrier air strength can be the main player in decisive battles. Please recommend this to the authorities immediately. Ozawa nodded with a smile. I will. Thus, after practice was ended in the first half of 1940, Ozawa submitted his opinion to the Minister of the Navy regarding the organization of the aviation fleet. Its substance was as follows, in order to exert maximum air power in a sea battle, it is required to concentrate all the striking power of our planes. In order to concentrate all our aviation striking power, an organisational structure with unified leadership of all naval flyers under a single commander is required from peacetime, enabling practice under his command at any time. If such a unified command of all aviation troops is based on a temporary military division, the resulting command will be temporary as well, ending up with a weak mental unity of the leader and subordinates and an uneven degree of proficiency, making it difficult to implement effective command for a mass assault. This is evident based on the fact that we failed to achieve a satisfactory result after all our practice in the first half of this year, in spite of repeated practices, by putting each aviation troop of the 1st and 2nd Aviation Squadrons and the 1st Combined Air Troop under a single temporary leadership. Therefore, we must organise the aviation fleet immediately in the combined fleet by transferring all the carriers to the fleeting order to expedite practice in view of the threatening international situation. I was happy as my ideas were fully reflected in Ozawa's recommendation to the Minister of Navy. From the beginning, I strove to make rapid progress in the air squadron's proficiency by taking initiatives ahead of, rather than following, directives from the command centre in the belief that it was a demonstration of the power of carriers to the entire nation. First of all, we did take-off and landing practice. It is nonsense if carrier crews have any problems with take-off and landing. Therefore, we did sufficient basic training, 
taking enough time until all air crews were able to take off and land without trouble. Then the next step was fast takeoff and landing. Fast takeoff and landing is a method to have planes land in succession while keeping landed planes at the forward end of the flight deck. This avoids having to lower the landed planes one by one to the hangar deck by elevator, and it eliminates the excessive time required to clear the deck before the next plane is allowed to land. However, in order to prevent those planes at the forward area from being damaged by a plane that crashed during landing, we put up a barricade to stop such planes. At a minimum, this would limit the damage to the landing plane. If, however, this method is forced on crews with insufficient skills, they will inevitably hit the barricade and damage the landed planes. Therefore, the policy was to allow fast landing for skilled pilots only. While the plan from the command centre followed this procedure this year as well, it was clear that this would hamper the achievement of mass deployment because of operational backups. I recommended that we allow fast landing for all crews. Captain Kusaka suspiciously asked, Commander, is it OK? To which I responded assuredly and proudly, No problem, sir. Thus, I imposed fast takeoff and landing practice on all crews, and every one of them did a perfect job without any problems. Ever since, we always performed landing operations by fast landing, and there was not a single incident throughout the year of a plane hitting the barricade. It proved that proficiency can be improved dramatically by well-controlled instruction and morale enhancement. The next step was night takeoff and landing. The capability to engage in nighttime action is based, of course, on proficiency in night takeoff and landing. Up until this point in time, this requirement also was imposed only on limited crews with superb proficiency. They were called night pigeons. I recommended that all crews be trained in night takeoff and landing. In response, Staff Aviation Officer Takeshi Aoki of the command centre asked with a doubtful look, Commander, won't there be any problems? Actually, night flight was still risky in those days. A few days earlier, there was a splashdown accident in the 2nd Aviation Squadron, caused by a flare dropped during night drill. The air staff had good reason to be concerned. There was also a rule set by the combined fleet prohibiting the illumination of planes during night practice or drill for safety reasons. However, I regretted that if planes should crash only because they were illuminated, we would never harness air power. We should give night action capability to all crews rather than call them night pigeons. Night takeoff and landing are fundamental to everything else. Pounding my chest, I told the aviation staff to leave it to me. After all, these recommendations of mine were simply because of my desire trying to respond to the will of Commander Ozawa, who said, Aviation is about mass. One day I was talking to the chief doctor in the Akagi's officer's room. Doctor, I understand medical progress has made eye transplant operations possible. I wonder, can a tiger's eyes be transplanted to me? The perplexed chief doctor was laughing, but I was serious. If my eyes could be replaced by a tiger's, I wanted the operation in order to engage in night torpedo attacks. It was early November, nearing the end of the year. The combined fleet engaged in various training drills en route from Ariaki Bay, officially called Shibushi Bay, to Seiki Bay in the north. It was the finish of the annual training program called Sengi, combat training, and many Sengi commissioners were sent from the central authority to investigate our performance. Our Akagi Air Squadron was going to launch actual torpedoes at night with drillheads attached, targeting four battleships of the 1st Squadron. The serial number of this particular drill was Operation No. 112. I took off from the Akagi, leading 27 planes of the Torpedo Bomber Squadron and nine planes of the Reconnaissance and Lighting Squadron, flying in search of the 1st Squadron. The point of a night assault is, first, detection of the enemy by the Reconnaissance Squadron, followed by the dropping of flares by the lighting squadron, and, finally, launching of torpedoes by the torpedo bombers. This operation will not succeed unless coordination among the three squadrons is done with perfect precision. On this night assault drill, the three parties worked in perfect harmony and assured a successful attack. While we were returning after the drill, we happened to catch a radio message from Commander-in-Chief Yamamoto on board his flagship Nagato, to Commander Ozawa that said, Operation No. 112 was superb. I was satisfied, but it was not merely because our operation was praised, 
but because we had succeeded in enlightening the Navy, even if to a limited extent, by actually proving the full capability of air power. The results of the Sengi Commissioner's performance investigation showed a hit ratio of 80% for the 27 torpedoes that were launched, with all four battleships declared eliminated ships. This meant that if this had been an actual battle, the ships had already been sent to the bottom of the sea. This was certainly clear proof that the source of naval power had already shifted to airplanes. It made me grind my teeth to think that they might come to understand this obvious fact only after an actual battle that battleships were floating just to be sunk by an air attack. It was a sweltering hot summer afternoon on August 25, 1941, and I was engaged in the training of the 3rd Air Squadron, now stationed at Iwakuni Air Base. Commander Kakuji Kakuta had moved his Admiral's flag to Iwakuni, and I was commanding the base exercises. I had finished the last puff of a cigar after my meal in the staff room. When I stood up and was heading to take an afternoon nap, the soldier in charge of distributing telegrams stopped me and said, Aviation Staff Officer, here are your telegrams, as he handed them to me. I began thumbing through them and I blurted out unconsciously, Wait, it's my transfer. At that time it had already been announced that we should be ready for the first step of preparatory operations to deploy military personnel. And irregular and frequent changes in assignment were being made before the normally scheduled year-end changes. Therefore it should not have been a bolt from the blue, but the point was my destination. The telegram read, Chief Aviation Commander of the Akagi. I had previously been the Chief Aviation Commander of the Akagi for a one-year assignment last year. I personally preferred to stay in that position for one more year, but I was assigned as the staff leader of the 3rd Aviation Squadron. Given this situation, I had good reason to expect that I would probably be assigned next year as the head of aviation elsewhere. Frankly, the thought of a transfer to the Akagi as the chief aviation commander for a second tour was mind-deadening. Flyers cannot escape the handicap of age. Anybody at the age of 40, even if he still maintains his fighting spirit, tends to have less physical stamina than younger men. If he tries to lead the air squadron at the head of the pack, Young pilots will simply regard him as a drag on the group. It would be better for an old warrior to take command on the ground as the head of aviation. The head of aviation is the first flight position in the squadron, but it is rare for him to embark on a plane. The position requires nothing but hanging around the airfield apron in front of the hangar like a tiger in the zoo, with a pair of big binoculars hanging from his neck. It is an enviable position of no flying and no worries about being shot down. As an expert fighter pilot, I still did not feel any deterioration in my skill levels, but I was already 39 years old, only one more year before turning 40. As I was hoping to be a member of the Envied group, I just wondered why once again the chief aviation commander. Grabbing the telegram, I went straight to the commander's room and knocked on his door. Commander, I have been assigned to the Akagi as the chief aviation commander. What? Sounding surprised, Commander Tsunoda got up from the sofa and looked at the telegram. Well, Chief Aviation Commander of the Akagi. But Fuchida, this could be a mistake. It could mean Head of Aviation. I never heard of a commander being assigned as the Chief Aviation Commander. Tell the telegram room to check it again. Then I gave a call to the telegram room, and their answer was that it could have been a mistake. It could have meant Head of Aviation, as it was an abbreviated telegram. The head of aviation was exactly what I wanted, and I was overjoyed. Commander Tsunoda himself broke into a big smile, saying, I told you, you are the head of aviation of the Akagi without fail. Congratulations, aviation staff officer. How would you like your farewell party to be held at Iwaso in Miyajima? Yes, please, thank you. As events unfolded, in my mind I was privately convinced that my position was the head of aviation, and reported to the Akagi, which was docked in Yokosuka. When I arrived, the air squadron was conducting training at Kagoshima base with no members remaining on the ship, except for the head of aviation, Commander Shogo Masuda. When we met, he told me, as a matter of fact, I knew that you were coming, so I did not have the slightest doubt that you would be the head of aviation, and I was preparing to pack my things for my next assignment. However, then I learned that you would be the chief aviation commander, and I will remain in my current position 
which was rather disappointing for me. Oh, really? Then I am the chief aviation commander, as I was told. It is not an easy job. While we were laughing because of the confusion caused by the earlier telegram, Lieutenant Commander Yoshishiro Miura dropped in. He talked to me. What I heard from Staff Office Agenda was that they are planning a concentrated deployment of aircraft carriers next year, and they require a big group aviation commander with a commander's rank to integrate the command of groups of carrier planes. As I heard this, I smacked my knee. Now I've got it. It was something that was left unfinished when I gave my departing recommendations last year to Commander Jisaburo Ozawa when I was the chief aviation commander of the Akagi. Now I was coming back to the main theme after having frittered away my time as the 3rd Aviation Squadron's staff officer. Needless to say, my second assignment as chief air commander of the Akagi was far from disappointing. This is an incredible, glorious honour. I will put my whole soul into this assignment, motivating our men, flying to the limit. As soon as I finished the arrival formalities on the Akagi, I flew to Kagoshima Air Base from Yokosuka Air Base that same day. Kagoshima Air Base was constructed on reclaimed land at Kamoika Beach just outside Kagoshima City. In front of the base was the majestic view of Mount Sakurajima. The Akagi Aviation Squadron was receiving training there. As I was the chief aviation commander last year, there were many familiar faces among the crew, and they welcomed me as if their old man had come back. The senior officer of the squadron was Lieutenant Shigaharu Murata. This guy had a jocular nature and was nicknamed Busan. He greeted me with a smile. Chief Commander, my sympathies on your second tour as the Chief Commander with your old bones, was his greeting, to which I responded, Busan, I am counting on your support once again. Days passed, and one day, when I was checking papers received at the Squadron Command Center, I found among them fleet orders from the commander of the First Aviation Fleet. There was an instruction to have Fuchida, the Chief Aviation Commander of the Akagi, take command of group training for the carrier squadrons of the First Aviation Fleet. I passed the paper to Murata, saying, Busan, look at this puzzling message. Clever Murata understood immediately what it implied, I see. If you overdo it, you are likely to be targeted by complaints from the carrier captains and heads of aviation. I replied, you see the point. Unless the Navy separates ground and air duties of the air squadrons soon, Commanding and operating them will become increasingly and incomprehensibly complex. Busan responded, I totally agree with you. It is not only the international situation which is incomprehensibly complex. Then we burst into laughter as the expression was fashionable at that time because Prime Minister Hiranuma's cabinet had resigned with a final message that the international situation was incomprehensibly complex. In 1941, the first aviation fleet consisted of four carriers, the Akagi and Kaga of the 1st Air Squadron and the Soryu and Hiryu of the 2nd Air Squadron. It was this year's epoch-making objective to deploy these four carriers as a collective group. And the general commander who will coordinate the planes taking off from four different carriers, forming into one group in the sky above the fleet and providing a concentrated attack on the enemy fleet, is me, the senior commanding officer. According to the official standing order at this time, air squadrons based on each carrier belonged under the command of the carrier's captain, and the training was also conducted under the responsibility of each captain. Traditionally, the fighting unit of the Navy has been the man of war, and the organisational order of the man of war has provided the basis for all organisational structures. The organisation of the air squadrons was no exception. However, based on the increasing importance of aviation power, if we were to introduce the concentrated use of carrier-based air squadrons and realise their mass destructive power, the captain of the carrier should be regarded as the master of a floating airfield, where his role is not to be the voice behind the command and operation of the air squadrons, but rather to take care of the maintenance and fuel supply of the planes based on his carrier. This is the theory of separation of air and ground duties, requiring the establishment of a different official chain of command in order to enable an integrated command and operational control of air squadrons. In those days, the supreme guideline of the Japanese Navy, Essential Directives of Naval Battles, stated in its platform that the need for military organisation exists in the battle. 
Hundreds of issues are determined by the battle. The separation of air and ground duties was perfectly in line with this understanding, but because of tradition-bound conventions, this separation was not in place. Under these circumstances, Carrier Division 1 issued an order to me, the unified commander of all air squadrons in battle, to take unified command of the training exercise as well. However, as Busan suggested, this role would invite complaints from the captains of each aircraft carrier, and it actually happened when they saw me carrying my enthusiasm to an extreme. They meant to say, we don't like the idea of the head of aviation of another ship giving orders to our squadron during the training exercise. However, this was sheer nonsense. If command and control procedures were not instilled during training exercises, they would not be followed during battle. Concerted coordination and action in actual battle are not possible unless a tight sense of mutual trust and smooth communications are established between the commander and his men from the very start of training exercises. I spent time on what we call suriaweze, smoothing out differences. While some carrier captains had a good understanding of why this was required, others who were newly assigned carrier captains had a hard time swallowing this line of reasoning. Then, Busan Lieutenant Murata told me, Commander, there is nothing that can replace the importance of strengthening our fighting capacity, whether the other carrier captains and aviation heads should hate you or not. Why don't we give our men tough exercises and push them to the limit without restraint? I have an idea. Let's have them call you General Commander to start with. I said, wait, if you use such an invented title, somebody like the Military Affairs Department may take it up. Busan smiled. It's okay, it will be a sort of nickname only for use inside the squadrons. We both laughed again. Around that time, all the air squadrons belonging to the four carriers of the 1st Aviation Fleet were concentrated at different air bases in southern Kyushu. They started their base exercises by plane type, not by the carrier to which they were assigned. For example, the main force of the level bombing and torpedo bombing squadrons of the Type 97 carrier attack bombers, Nakajima B-5N, were located at Kagoshima Air Base. The rest were stationed at Izumi Air Base. Air superiority squadrons of the Type 0 carrier fighters were stationed altogether at Saiki Air Base. Finally, my life had become quite hectic, leading combined group training of as many as 200-plus planes, while maintaining close contact with each base from the command centre at Kagoshima Base. It was a muggy day in late September 1941, when I was taking a short break at the command centre after a drill flight, a soldier came in to report. General Commander, Staff Officer Gender has come to see you. What, Gender? I stood up from my chair. Lieutenant Commander Minoru Gender, Operations Staff Officer of the 1st Aviation Fleet, was in the same class with me, the 52nd class of the Naval Academy. Since those early days, we both aspired to be aviators, and we had been extremely close friends. Hey, howdy, I greeted and invited him into the command centre. Then he whispered into my ear, saying, Actually, Fuchi, I have something very confidential to tell you. Hearing this, I ushered him to my private room, where Genda revealed his secret. The fact is, you have been assigned at this time as the general commander of the air attack squadron for the Pearl Harbor air raid. This was a total bolt out of the blue for me, and I asked him, what's all this about the Pearl Harbor air raid? Then, Gender responded, setting aside the details, the general story is that the prospect of peace talks between Japan and the US is taking a dark turn. Therefore, Fleet Admiral Yamamoto's idea is that if by any chance war should break out between Japan and the United States, we should launch an air attack on Pearl Harbor immediately at the outbreak of war and annihilate the US Pacific Fleet. It is only possible if we deploy the air attack squadrons of the first aviation fleet's carriers, and you are the one who will lead them. I was overexcited by this news as I thought that things had turned out to be so very interesting. I also guessed that Gender might have played the role of scout leading to my assignment this time around as the chief aviation commander of the Akagi. Far from begrudging the assignment, it was indeed an enormous honour for me. And I thought that the best thing you could have in life is a good friend. Gender added, however, there are still many specific issues that we have to discuss. So I want you to accompany me now to the Akagi together. 
In the Chief of Staff's room, a model of Oahu Island has arrived, and all informational materials about Pearl Harbor have been prepared. I also want you to see Commander Yamamoto and the Chief of Staff to talk about arrangements for the Pearl Harbor air attack plan, and of course, the future training of the air squadrons that will back up the plan. Yes, let's go, I responded joyfully, becoming very enthusiastic. The two of us flew from Kagoshima Base to Kasanohara Base in my plane, went to Shibushi Harbor by car, and then proceeded on a boat that was waiting for us to the flagship Akagi, anchored in Ariaki Bay. Now I found myself in the Chief of Staff room. There was a model of Oahu Island in the centre, almost the size of eight tatami mats, roughly one thirty square feet, which was so precise it looked like a real view as seen from above. Looking outside through the porthole, the surface of Ariaki Bay was glistening with the afternoon sunlight, and tropical plants on Biro Island grew thickly. After the Akagi's motorboat went away leaving a white ship wake, the surrounding sights were peaceful enough to induce sleep. Nevertheless, in the midst of this peaceful environment, an argument was going on about the dangers of an air attack on Pearl Harbor, a sort of risk everything on one last throw of the dice. At this meeting in the Chief of Staff's room, among those present were Vice Admiral Chuichi Nagumo, Commander of the First Aviation Fleet, Rear Admiral Ryunosuke Kusaka, Chief of Staff and their staffs. While I understood the outline of the operation, I looked at the sea chart of Pearl Harbor and asked gender, I understand that Admiral Yamamoto has instructed us to sink the Pacific Fleet berthed in Pearl Harbor by torpedo attack, but as far as I can see in this chart, the depth at Pearl Harbor is only 12 meters. It is too shallow for a torpedo attack. In those days, the Imperial Japanese Navy's method of torpedo attack was to launch torpedoes from an altitude of 100 meters with a sighting distance of 1,000 meters. The dropped torpedo then went about 60 meters under the sea, which we called the degree of sinking. At this degree of sinking, the torpedo's engine is ignited, the screw starts to rotate, and the rudder begins to function, resulting in the rise of the torpedo towards the surface. Afterwards, the torpedo keeps a fixed depth of six meters as it runs towards the target. Then, it hits and explodes one meter above the bottom of the target ship's seven-meter draft and sinks. Since our assumptive battle areas in the Pacific Ocean were among the deepest waters in the world, our torpedo's degree of sinking was not an item that our planners had considered up to this point in time. However, this method of torpedo attack could not be applied to Pearl Harbor, which had a depth of only 12 meters. If we stuck to the traditional method of torpedo attack with a degree of sinking of 60 meters, we would travel the long distance to Pearl Harbor only for pile driving. However, Gender responded, if we launch torpedoes where they can be effective, we probably will not achieve much because the enemy will quite probably utilize defensive measures like extending nets. Instead, where torpedoes are not expected to work, if we make them function, 100% achievement will be guaranteed. Fushi, one way or another, you must come up with a solution. I gave in to this forceful argument by Gender. He was absolutely right. Gender used to be called by the nickname Mad Gen, because the brilliance of his ideas gave the impression to everybody that he was either a genius or a madman. However, I was determined now to somehow launch torpedoes at Pearl Harbor, with its 12-meter depth based on Mad Gen's original idea. I was also quite mad myself, I asserted to Gender. Okay, at all costs, I will make the torpedo attack a success. However, as we see in those photos, the American Pacific Fleet is berthed in pairs at the mooring piles around Ford Island. Torpedoes will not reach the ships on the inside. We will probably have to employ level bombing as well. Gender responded, You see the point. That is why we have asked the arms department at Yokosuka Naval Air Technical Arsenal to make armor-piercing shells by shaving the 16 inches, 800 kilogram shells of the Nagato. I said that I understood then, to make extra sure, Chief of Staff Kusaka said, we want Commander Fuchida to proceed with training in line with this air raid plan and to prepare for all eventualities. However, this is the top secret among military secrets, and this is not yet the time to inform ordinary flyers. So we want Commander Fuchida to start training without attracting attention. While we sympathize with you in your predicament, we are very pressed for time, and we want you to begin training for this urgent matter immediately. 
I expressed my opinion to the Chief of Staff. I understand, sir. However, since the main element of our plan will be the torpedo attack, I would like to share the objective of this training with Lieutenant Murata. He is the commander of the Akagi's torpedo bombing squadron, and it will be critical to have him engaged in the torpedo attack in shallow seas. You said Murata. I approve. The Chief of Staff nodded and added, In any event at the earliest opportunity, I intend to call a meeting of our heads of aviation and explain our objective to them. In order to attain the fastest possible improvement of our required skills, it will make a difference once they understand. Anyway, I think we have no time to lose, and I am counting on you, Commander. For our air attack on the US Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor at the very inception of the war, we assumed that the enemy capital ships berthed there would be four aircraft carriers and eight battleships. These were the main targets of our air attack squadrons, and the main force assigned to the attack task force was a total of 90 planes of Type 97 carrier attack bombers. The 90 planes were divided into a level bombing squadron of 50 planes and a torpedo bombing squadron of 40 planes. The level bombing squadron was to be placed under my direct command, and the torpedo bombing squadron was to be led by Murata. In those days, the Japanese Navy adopted a probable odds bombing calculation method because the targeting accuracy of level bombing was not so good. Under this method, each of the nine bombers in a formation would drop their bomb according to the sighting of the guide bomber plane at the head of the formation, trying to secure a hit of at least one out of the nine bombs by sandwiching the target within the impact zone. This method was highly inefficient because it required a lot of planes to ensure the required killing shots. However, there was no other choice because, based on experience, not a single hit was secured by any of the nine planes if they were not flying in formation. Furthermore, in order to sink enemy carriers or battleships, the intention was to have our armour-piercing bombs penetrate the target's deck and, with a delayed fuse, explode at the targeted ship's bottom. Since we had no inventory of armour-piercing bombs for use at Pearl Harbour, as an emergency measure, we made them by shaving the 16-inch shells of the Nagato-class battleships. By testing the piercing power of modified 800kg armour-piercing bombs, it was proved that dropping the bombs from an altitude of 3,000 metres would be sufficient to penetrate the armoured decks of the US battleships. It was decided that a five-plane formation instead of nine would be sufficient to achieve our probable odds bombing objectives, given that we would be aiming at non-moving targets below from the low altitude of 3,000 metres. Accordingly, the 50 planes of the level bombing squadron were organised into 10 sub-squadrons. In level bombing, the lower the altitude, the higher the probability of hitting the target. However, the enemy anti-aircraft fire would hit better as well. It is a matter of balance, but in wartime, we have to hit the targets with our bombs instead of shrinking from enemy fire. The altitude of 3,000 metres is where the enemy fire is concentrated the most, and level bombing at this altitude requires a lot of guts, but we had more than enough guts on our side. Thus, the level bombing squadron practiced day in and day out, trying to improve their skill by dropping exercise bombs from an altitude of 3,000 metres. On a target in the shape of an Oklahoma-type battleship, which was drawn with lime on the Navy bombing range at Shibushi Beach. However, the problem was the torpedo bombing practice. The water depth of 12 metres still remained an obstacle, and the sinking degree of launched torpedoes needed to be reduced to 10 metres. 40 planes of the torpedo bombing squadron carried 800 kilogram torpedoes. Lieutenant Murata, commander of the torpedo bombing squadron, was the top expert of torpedo attacks, and he thought long and hard to find a solution for the shallow water torpedo attack. The objective was a sinking degree of 10 metres, and he consequently reduced the launching altitude to 10 metres, almost touching the surface of the sea. At the same time, he changed the torpedo's launching position to a nose angle of zero, with the plane's velocity at 160 knots, aiming at skipping the launched torpedoes at a shallow angle. Unrelenting practice went on every day. In order to recover the training torpedoes, they were launched in the deep waters of Kagoshima Bay, and the sinking degree was checked by a recorder attached to the torpedo head. Meanwhile, the skill of the flyers improved day by day, until the sinking degree stabilised within 20 metres. Just one more stretch to go, 
but the performance improvement stopped there. No matter how many times were peated bloodshedding practice drills, the sinking degree refused to go down further. Finally, among the torpedo flyers, there were some mutterings. Why don't they compromise with a 20-metre sinking degree? Where on earth is there a fleet that berths in such a shallow place with a depth of only 10 metres? They had reason to complain. There should be no fleet that berths in shallow waters of only 10 metres depth. While flyers knew that the practice was intended to attack berthed ships, nobody realised yet that it was Pearl Harbour. Besides, we tried hard not to give a single hint to them that would give away our secret. We knew perfectly well that if we simply revealed to them that the target was Pearl Harbour, their muttering would have disappeared in an instant, making them exert several times more effort. But it was not allowed yet. While we admired their efforts to have come so far as to have attained a sinking degree of 20 metres, there was no effective difference compared to a sinking degree of 60 metres. There was no compromise possible with the target of 10 metres, not even by one metre. One day, my Naval Academy classmate, Lieutenant Commander Takeshi Naito, came to see me at Kagoshima Base. He was also a close friend from the days when we both aspired to be aviators. Hey, I thought you went to Germany, right? I was there for one year, more or less, but I was called back. Naito was the assistant military attaché to the German embassy, and on his way back he stopped over at the Taranto naval port, with orders to conduct a survey on what was referred to as the Taranto Incident. On November 11, 1940, more than a dozen seaplanes from two squadrons of the British Royal Navy made a surprise attack on the Taranto naval port and sank three Italian battleships anchored there using torpedoes. The sea where the torpedoes were launched had a depth of 14 metres, and it was reported that the seaplanes launched their torpedoes almost touching the sea surface. Naito gave me details of the battle. And when he finished talking, I asked him, Who told you to come to tell me this story? It was Mr. Fukudome of the General Staff. Hmm. I gave a groan. It was Rear Admiral Shigeru Fukudome, head of the Operations Bureau. You know why you came here to tell me the story? I asked Naito, to which he said, No, it's okay if you don't know, I will not tell you myself, but you'll come to know. But thanks for telling me this useful story, it helped. I thanked Naito again. So, there was actually a successful case of launching torpedoes in shallow waters, I was encouraged by this battle case. I was elated that we would not lose to John Bull's British Navy. Around that time, we were provided with torpedoes fitted with stabilising fins using gyroscopes to improve the launched torpedo's entry angle into the sea surface. In actual use, they performed very well, almost reaching the targeted sinking degree of 10 metres. But the performance was still uneven, and we wanted one more month of practice to gain more confidence. However, we were already running out of time. The Fleet Command Centre unofficially announced the completion of all practices on or close to November 10th. We were already in early November, leaving us fewer than ten days. I was upset because I wanted to give to each flyer all 40 planes the opportunity to actually launch one torpedo to boost their confidence before we finished our practice. I made this request to the command centre, but their response was that it was out of the question. Their reasoning was, if they agreed to my request, it would reduce the supply of torpedoes for the expeditionary operation to Hawaii. In the end, they let me move forward, but limited the practice launch to just three torpedoes. I was discouraged with that number, but there was no choice. I decided to select three pilots with daily proven skill levels, first, second and third grade. We did a location survey for 12 metres water depth at Kamoiki Beach. We took the tides into consideration as well, put down white and red flags and had the three pilots launch their torpedoes. Lieutenant Murata and I watched from above in a plane flown by Murata. The first torpedo was launched by the pilot with the first grade rating. The torpedo left a long and straight white wake. Then, the next torpedo was launched by the second grade pilot. It was also beautiful. Lastly, the pilot with the third grade tried, but, as anticipated, the torpedo got stuck in the seabed, emitting a lot of bubbles. As we got off the plane, Murata appeared to have broken down. Tapping his shoulder, I encouraged Murata, look Busan, long time ago, on the occasion of the Battle of Ichi no Tani, Minamoto no Yoshitsune, 
approached the Hyodorigo Pass with his army. The hills appeared too steep to run down. Then Yoshitsuna asked the guide if he had ever seen horses coming down the hills. The reply was that while he had never seen horses coming down, deer could go down. Hearing this, Yoshitsuna said, Both horses and deer have four legs, and he kicked two horses downhill. One fell, injured, but the other one went down safely. He looked back at his soldiers and said, If half of you should reach the enemy, the victory is ours. Follow me. And Yoshitsune led the brave assault descending the steep hills and attacked the enemy from behind. Thus, the Battle of Ichi no Tani ended up in total victory for Yoshitsune. In that situation, Yoshitsune bet that his chance of victory was one out of two. Now, we are betting that our chances are two out of three, we have a better chance. Just like the downhill assault at Hiodorigo, the surprise attack at Pearl Harbor will be spearheaded by the torpedo bombing squadron. If two-thirds of the 40 launch torpedoes should make it through, that makes 27 torpedo hits. It will be enough to kill the US Pacific Fleet, Busan. It's you guys. Follow me. Murata was taken aback, and his depressed face returned to a smile. Incidentally, a short while later, Murata was promoted to Lieutenant Commander effective November 15th, and Genda and I were also promoted to Commander. And as it turned out, according to materials published by the US officials after the war, this two-thirds success ratio was correct. On the very day of the Pearl Harbor air attack, while five out of the 40 planes of the torpedo bombing squadron were shot down, 27 torpedoes launched by the surviving bombers hit their targets, with the following results. After the Pearl Harbor air attack, the Pearl Harbor Investigation Commission was convened many times, and the official report, which was massive, allocated many pages to the torpedo attack by the Japanese Air Force. It stated that the biggest damage to the US ships on December 7, 1941, was caused by the torpedoes launched by the Japanese bombers. It also added that those torpedoes were specially devised to meet the mode of attack executed by the Japanese Air Force on that day. However, with regard to the issue of why the Pacific Fleet did not extend torpedo defence nets, the official report stated that, according to professional opinions at the highest levels in the United States, the likelihood of such an attack had been considered impossible until the Japanese Air Force proved that attack by torpedo bombers could be accomplished easily in shallow waters like Pearl Harbor, and even under the restrictive conditions of short distances from combat targets. Therefore, they concluded that the Pacific Fleet's commanders could not be accused of failing in their duties. Here I saw all the hard toil and labour of the Japanese torpedo bombing squadron rewarded trying to make the impossible possible and sending torpedoes to their targets at a water depth of 12 metres. Imperial headquarters had already been established, and the Navy General Staff was incorporated as the Naval Department of the Imperial Headquarters. It was not long after that they were involved in conceptualising the operations of the expedition to Hawaii, as proposed by Admiral Yamamoto. This drove them into a frenzy as they prepared for the abruptly introduced operation. Initially, the command centre of the 1st Aviation Fleet, headed by Commander Nagumo and Chief of Staff Kusaka, was against the expedition to Hawaii. However, once the decision was made to proceed, they were fully occupied with preparations for the operation. A key problem was increasing the cruising capacity of the ships that would be participating in the attack. As was widely known, the foundational principle of operations of the Imperial Japanese Navy was based on the assumption of a decisive battle in the Western Pacific. In addition, because of the constraints imposed by the Naval Treaty, the Imperial Navy was compelled to fight with only 70% of the US Navy's fighting capacity. Therefore, the General Staff developed operational plans with distinctive characteristics in order to secure victory. They intended to maintain the option to fight or not to fight against the US fleet by taking advantage of the superior speed of our ships. On the other hand, the US Navy's war plans against Japan were based on trans-oceanic offence-oriented operations. Therefore, they emphasised cruising capacity in designing fighting ships. If cruising capacity is emphasised, superiority in speed is reduced. As a result, the maximum speed of the US capital ships remained at 19 knots at most. 
In contrast, under the assumptive condition of a showdown in the Western Pacific, the Japanese Navy did not have to worry about cruising capacity. They concentrated on superior speed, and 30 knots was required even for capital ships. Thus, the Imperial Navy had a chance to win the planned for decisive fleet battle by securing the option of fight or not to fight. However, in the case of the long expedition to Hawaii, our lack of sufficient cruising capacity emerged as an obstacle. Therefore, there was no other way but to replenish our fuel while cruising on the ocean, but it would not be easy if the sea was rough. In addition, the choice of which route to take was an issue. If we needed accompanying tankers for our fuel supply, we were going to be a grand fleet of more than 30 ships. And if such a grand fleet should push forward across the Pacific Ocean 3,000 nautical miles to Hawaii, there would be no place to hide. There also would be no chance of winning if the air attack on Pearl Harbor was not a surprise attack. The general staff was in utter confusion. Kusaka, however, was not panicked at all. He ordered Lieutenant Commander Risaburo Sasabe to check the routes taken by all merchant ships in the world that crossed the Pacific Ocean over the past ten years. Despite his dull appearance, Staff Officer Sasabe was intelligent, and he presented his report based on his survey of all the records of the world's shipping companies. According to the report, it was noted that there had not been a single merchant ship that passed the northern latitude of 40 degrees during the winter months, which included December. More important, the northern latitude of 40 degrees is in the middle of the patrol zones from the US bases at Midway and the Aleutians. Kusaka decided to choose this course. However, there was a reason that not a single ship took this course. The northern latitude of 40 degrees coincided with an area of turbulent seas in the northern Pacific during the winter period. If rough weather continued every day, fuel replenishment on the ocean could not be implemented. Kusaka seemed to have worried about these conditions a great deal, but he did not change his tough stance. Although refueling on rough seas would be very difficult, there could be no compromise regarding the need for secrecy of the attack plan. The only option was to do all that we could possibly do with respect to refueling on the ocean. On this point, the admirals of the fleet were convinced. In the meantime, what emerged as my headache was the issue of participation of the carriers of Carrier Division 5, the Zuikaku and the Shikaku. These two ships had just been commissioned, and the degree of proficiency of the carrier-based air squadron was very insufficient. The inclusion of Carrier Division 5 to the 1st Aviation Fleet, which now consisted of six carriers, added fighting capacity in terms of the number of planes. However, in terms of quality, their squadron could not keep pace with the air squadrons of Carrier Divisions 1 and 2. Besides, there was no time left to quickly improve their proficiency. If those with different levels of proficiency should engage together in a group action, the group would be inevitably forced to adjust to the lowest level of proficiency. This was the source of my distress. This was exactly the reason why we used to advocate the necessity of separating air and ground duties. And if only this policy had been in place before the completion of their motherships, the Zuikaku and Shokaku, the air squadron of Carrier Division 5, could have participated in the combined group practice together with air squadrons of Carrier Divisions 1 and 2, and achieved the same high degree of proficiency. Anyway, nothing could be done at this stage, and I talked to Gender to decide how to annihilate the capital ships of the US Pacific Fleet, relying on the highly skilled air squadrons of Carrier Divisions 1 and 2. We opted to have Carrier Division 5's air squadron carry out attacks on the enemy air bases, where their lower proficiency would be less of a major problem. However, the Pearl Harbor air raid was scheduled as a dawn attack, piercing through the early morning darkness. For this reason, our plan called for dispatch and flight at night, but because of the uncertainty of the capability of Carrier Division 5's air squadron to perform night action, we were obliged to change our plan's takeoff at dawn and flight during daylight, which meant that the Pearl Harbor air raid would be a daylight attack. This made us feel uncertain as to whether it would be a surprise attack. While we were struggling with these various problems and breaking our necks during fierce practice drills, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary Saburo Kurusu flew to the United States via Hong Kong on November 5th. His role as envoy was to restore peace to the Pacific, assisting Japan's ambassador to the United States, 
Kichisaburo Nomura. But ironically, on that same day, November 5th, Daikaire was issued in absolute secrecy. The entire text was as follows. Daikaire Dai Ichigo, November 5th, 1941, on behalf of His Majesty, from Chief of the General Staff Osami Nagano Order, to the Commander of the Combined Fleet Yamamoto. The Empire has decided to complete various preparations of operations aiming at early December, in view of substantial fears that it will become unavoidable to commence war with the United States, the United Kingdom and the Netherlands for the sake of self-existence and self-defence, Commander of the Combined Fleet will implement required preparations for operations. Regarding the detailed items, I will have Commander of General Staff provide instructions. Based on this, Daikairai no one, Yamamoto issued an order on the same day to Admiral Nagumo, the commander of the Task Force Fleet, as follows. Task Force Fleet will assemble and implement fuel supply in Hitokapu Bay by November 22nd, in utmost confidentiality of its activities. Accordingly, Nagumo mobilized the six carriers of the first air fleet, namely the Akagi, Kaga, Soryu, Hiryu, Zuikaku and Shokaku to the coast of Hyuga, Miyazaki Prefecture, on November 10th in order to accommodate the air squadrons that had been engaged in practice at their bases in southern Kyushu. There was a drill the next day, November 11th. The six aircraft carriers of the first air fleet dispatched all their planes at dawn, according to the Pearl Harbor attack plan, while heading to the north off the coast of Hyuga. The planes performed the attack drill on the combined fleet, which was anchored in Seiki Bay as the practice targets. On that day, I assumed my role as general commander of the air attack squadron, and I could see the beautiful results of the past two months of combined group practice, with flawless communication between leaders and followers, and smooth coordination among the groups. Later, I learned from Lieutenant Commander Akira Sasaki, aviation staff officer of the combined fleet, that Admiral Yamamoto himself was watching the attack drill from the flagship Nagato and was very pleased. I myself was very happy to know that Commander Yamamoto, the very person who originated the idea of the air raid, was content. After the drill, the first air fleet entered and anchored at Saki Bay. On the next day, November 12th, commanders of each level of the Nagumo Task Force fleet gathered on the flagship Akagi, and Commander Yamamoto visited Akagi with his staff. It was a farewell to mark the start of the expedition to Hawaii. I was present as the general commander of the air attack squadron. Yamamoto delivered a cautionary farewell speech addressed to the task force commanders. The daring attempt of today's task force is intended to destroy the Pacific fleet of the United States at their home base at the very beginning of the start of war, making a long journey to Hawaii to attack in the event that war against the United States should become unavoidable. Under the circumstances, the destiny of all operations that will follow depends on the success or failure of this operation. From the beginning, we aimed at a surprise attack to take advantage of their lack of expectation and preparedness, taking them by surprise, overcoming all possible difficulties. But what I have heard is that Admiral Kimmel, commander of the US Pacific Fleet, is an admiral with keen insight and judgment, and I would guess that he has taken all possible precautionary measures against all contingencies, making thorough preparations. Therefore, I want you to be prepared so you will not suffer an unforeseen upset, but with the anticipation that it will be a surprise assault. As Yamamoto was leaving, he noticed that I was watching him from the corner of the room. He came straight up to me, extending his hand. There were no words, but it was a firm handshake. And his eyes, staring at me, were full of confidence in me. In return, my eyes should have reflected my burning will to fully accomplish my duty. After the air squadrons of Carrier Division 1 withdrew from their bases in southern Kyushu, the troops of the 12th Combined Training Air Squadron, positioned in northern Kyushu, moved in immediately the next day. This was a cover action to prevent espionage leaks. If close to 400 planes flying all day and all night until only yesterday should disappear suddenly, people might suspect. Where have they gone, and it is not possible to seal their mouths? Therefore the pilots of the training squadron were dispatched to start flying their planes from the next day, without any interruption. Needless to say, the nature of practice was different, but appeared the same. 
They also attended carefully to the prevention of espionage regarding communications, and in order not to change the volume of communications from the previous day, the bases exchanged messages with the pilots in training using the same call codes. As such, maximum efforts were made to ensure the success of a surprise attack at Pearl Harbor. Next, each ship of the task force left its inland berth, having prepared for the mission in a quiet manner. There was nobody around to send them off amidst loud cheers. The measures to prevent espionage were taken so seriously that all letters sent by crew members to their families before the mission were put in sacks and released for delivery, only after confirmation of the success of the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. For this reason, it was rumoured that a newlywed bride who used to receive letters with the regularity of her morning and evening newspapers got so upset by the abrupt interruption of the flow of letters from her husband that she insisted on a divorce. In this setting, one by one, each ship of the task force headed to Hitokapu Bay, making its individual course and avoiding sea lanes normally used by merchant ships in order to remain unseen. Even stronger precautions were taken to avoid US submarines that might have been deployed for surveillance in the seas off Japan. Some ships took detours in the Pacific Ocean, and others bypassed the Sea of Japan. By sealing all telegraph keys, transmission of electrical waves was strictly controlled with the highest degree of caution. From the east edge of Hokkaido, the Chishima Islands extend to the northeast across the Nemuro Straits. The first island is Kunashiri, and the second one is Etorofu. At almost the centre of the south coast, there is a bay called Hitokapu. It was a desolate port rarely visited except by fishing boats that gathered, then left during fishing season. Winter in Chishima comes early. Snow is already seen in November.